Rotary has a, a reputation for being a force for good because it's so it's so big and it does so many things as a club. If you're thinking about Rotary, reach out to anyone you know who's in it. I'm sure they'd be happy to show you around. If you make the, the point or the time in, in, in your schedule to get there, uh, Rotary will quickly kind of get its arms around you and get you involved. So I would just encourage people who are curious or interested, attend an event, get involved and take the next step. And I, and I think Rotary will meet you halfway and take it the rest, the rest of the way. I've met a lot of new friends through Rotary. It's been great to uh, meet people that you maybe are aware of, but haven't had the opportunity to sit down and break bread with, connect with new people, make good business contacts, even get some clients as well as make a difference. I would say it's the network. Even though we're not meeting, uh, not able to meet face to face in person due to the pandemic, I still think the virtual network is a strong bond. So it's so helpful for me to learn from other Rotarians who have had different experiences than I do, have, have, have different perspectives on the issues our region is facing, and then be able to um, connect and share and find overlap in how we can work together. It's like, what is your why? You know, you look at Simon Sinek, talks about it a lot. You know, I think Rotary speaks to my why. It's going to make you a better person. You're going to be better for helping the community out. Welcome, members of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee, and also welcome, members of the Women's Club of Wisconsin. I am Rotary Club President Darren Miller, President and Owner of JM Construction. As we gather virtually today, we will open with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prior to our invocation today, it's with a heavy heart that we will be taking a moment of silence in honor of fellow Rotarian Bill Durkin a valued member of our club for more than 20 years who passed away this past Sunday. In the words of his beloved wife and best friend, Katie Pritchard, he fought cancer valiantly over six years while continuing to enjoy life, cause good trouble, and to care for others. There will be a quiet service soon in pandemic permitting, a fitting celebration of his life and many contributions later this summer. Of course, we hold him and his family and friends in our thoughts and prayers. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And now Karen Hung, founder and CEO of Silver Rock Consulting will give our invocation today. Karen. Thank you, President Darren. To reflect today's speaker topic of the environment and climate, I'm sharing a biblical scripture that speaks to stewardship 1 Corinthians 4.2, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the beautiful world you have created. Help us to be good and trustworthy stewards of our planet and ecosystems in the right way. Amen. Thank you, Karen. And now we'll run with a bit of club business. First, I'd like to introduce Kathy Peterson, Director of Portside Investment Advisors and President of the Women's Club of Wisconsin to say a few words. Kathy? Thank you and hello everyone. It is an honor for the Women's Club of Wisconsin to partner with the Rotary Club of Milwaukee, two distinguished and long serving service organizations in our community. The Women's Club of Wisconsin was founded in 1876 by Martha Mitchell and several other visionary women leaders in the community. They created a women-owned stock company, which was revolutionary for the time, and established the first women's private club building in the United States, now a registered historic landmark. Since the mid-1960s, the club created a charitable foundation, and we have granted $1.9 million dollars to worthy nonprofits in the Milwaukee area. Club lectures such as this, along with other events, develop an understanding of the complex issues facing our community 
and initiate community involvement on the part of our members. We have many special interests within our club, clubs within our club, including a business networking group. We're no longer your grandmother's club. If you would like further information, please contact me through the Women's Club of Wisconsin or at my business in Mequon, Portside Investment Advisors. Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. There's always a lot going on at the Rotary Club Milwaukee, and I will quickly be running through some reminders and announcements. A hearty thanks to the 34 members of Rotary who have already contributed over $7,000 to our Stop Polio Now campaign. A generous match is being provided by the Zilber Family Foundation, which will double your gift up to $10,000 for the club, which will then be tripled by the Gates Foundation. So a $100 gift becomes a $600 investment in fighting polio. Spots are still available for the April 28th tours of the sensational Warner Grand Theater, the new home of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Jerry Stepaniak, co-chair of the Tyro Terrian Committee has let the office know that given there's still space available, for those of you who have already signed up, the remaining spaces will now be open to guests. So please sign up a guest uh, with the Rotary office. Today is the last day to sign up for the River Keeper cleanup this coming Saturday and the cleanup in the Johnson's Park neighborhood. You'll only be able to join uh, to help one in one place, but we hope to see you at one of the two. Beer enthusiasts should show up at the Explorium Brew Pub in the Third Ward on Thursday, April 22nd at 5.30 p.m. for some socially distanced beer and rotary camaraderie. Many of our members have shown a deep commitment to deepening their understanding of issues of racial equity and disparities. We just finished reading Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and we will now turn to The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together by Heather McGee. The first discussion will take place on May 20th. Make sure to watch the email that comes after the program where you will find a link that makes the polio donation uh, easier and details regarding the registration links for all the events that I just mentioned. Join us this Thursday to hear from Jim Temer, president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau serving Wisconsin. Jim will share the top 10 scams targeting businesses and recent consumer scams seen by the BBB. Finally, we are making plans to return to Memorial Hall on Tuesday, May 4th. In these early weeks of returning to in-person meetings, we need our members to tell us whether or not they plan to attend. So check your email for a link to RSVP. And now Rotarian Debbie Patel, who is also the recent past president of the Women's Club of Wisconsin, will introduce our program for today. Debbie. Thank you so much, Darren. I'm unmuted. All right, somehow I got muted, but I'm unmuted now. Uh, One of the very few um, advantages of the COVID pandemic is that guests can zoom in from anywhere. And so I'm pleased to have my good friend, Dan Reeschneider join us today, courtesy of the World Wide Web. Dan is the former State Department Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Environment. He led the United States State Department's climate change team from the George H.W. Bush administration through the Obama administration. I've known Dan for more than 30 years. So what we plan to do today is have a conversation between friends. We're going to try to cover three buckets, negotiations among countries generally, the Paris Agreement, and the future of climate change negotiations and practices. So, and rather than provide a detailed biography of this amazing career diplomat up front, you're gonna get to know Dan through our conversation. Um, We do hope to have time for questions, so please put them in the chat box and we will get to as many as we can. So starting with, uh, thank you, Dan, again, for for joining us today. So, So we're going to start with negotiating international agreements. I met you in 1977 when we were both night students at the GW Law School in Washington, D.C. And at that time, you were negotiating fishing agreements. 
you would regale us with stories of drinks and deals made abo aboard Russian trawlers. At the time you were with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. You later moved to the State Department and in 1989, you became the head of a new section under George H.W. Bush's administration. It was called the Office of Global Change. So how did a guy who started with, with the plan to be an expert in Russia and the Soviet Union end up negotiating international agreements? We wanna know a bit about how it's done. And I'd like to know what it's like to do this kind of work over a 30 year period through different administrations with opposing views on a variety of subjects. Okay. Well, thanks, Kathy. It, you know, it's kind of funny <clears throat> because um, I didn't, I, I, I was going to graduate school at Georgetown University and doing a degree in Russian area studies. And it took me a while to figure out that, you know, the world doesn't really organize itself around area studies majors. Um, it really organizes itself around what I call functional specialties, you know, banking, law, insurance, that kind of thing. Um, I happened, uh, I was very fortunate though, out of my program to get a job working on something called the US, USSR Fisheries Claims Board, because at the time Russian vessels were um, allegedly tearing up gear and, and damaging vessels in our 200 mile, in our, well, off our coasts, put it that way. It was before 200 mile legislation. And the Russians decided to form a small uh, conciliation group that would pay American fishermen if they uh, could establish that their, their vessels had in fact damaged the nets, lobster pots in New England, offshore lobster pots, black cod off the coast of uh, Oregon and California, and king crab uh, off the coast of Alaska. So it was a pretty interesting job for me, but I remember one of my professors just laughing when I told him what I was doing, because he said, ah, we, we train all these Sovietologists and what do they do? They end up working in fish. And I thought, well, but you see the only other jobs available in those days, if you had a background in that area, were working for one of the, you know, um, uh, one of the agencies, CIA or DIA or something like that, which for a number of reasons I, I chose not to do. But I, I went to work negotiating fishing agreements uh, at NOAA. And it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever done. And I thought I could never tear myself away uh, until one night on a plane flying from Washington to Seattle, um, the, the general counsel of NOAA, who was on the plane with me, said, well, how long are you going to keep doing this fish business? And I said, well, I don't know, because it's just about the most interesting thing I've ever done. And he said, well, you know, one day you're going to have to decide whether it's the subject matter that fascinates you or whether you're the kind of person that could get interested in whatever he does. And I finally, I thought about that, it was very profound. And I decided I was kind of the, the kind of person that would get interested in whatever he did. And so um, I ended up moving from, well, I had an opportunity to go from the, the Commerce Department, from NOAA to the State Department, still doing fish. But then at one point I was able to move into a new area, science and technology agreements, that was really fascinating. Uh, and then in 1989, they came along and had, they were creating this new office the Office of Global Change, which was a, a kind of a funny place because we get calls um, from people all the time, you know, saying, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about martial law in Poland. And I'd say, well, I'm really sorry, ma'am, but we don't do martial law in Poland. She said, of course you do. You're the Office of Global Change. You know, so anything, any change in the world was fair game, people thought. But this was really about climate change. And it was in 1989 when, um, uh, I think some people probably heard of the, the issue, but, uh, and it was coming into its own, but it was nowhere near on the front burner the way it is today. So, so what was interesting at the time is that I remember thinking that they couldn't use the word climate and they couldn't use warming. So it was called global change, which I thought was, um, was pretty interesting, but things moved forward through many different administrations. And um, did you wanna add a minute about how that, the ups and downs of the various administrations, you, bef before Paris, which was 2015, you know, you had, you had Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. And what was that like to navigate this department through those different, um, the different values and, and positions on things. Well, you know, it was an emerging issue at the time. Um, 
but it was nowhere near as polarized as it's become today. Um, back in those days, there were quite a number of people on both sides of the aisle, meaning Democrats and Republicans who were quite concerned about the issue. And, um, you know, people didn't want to do crazy things, but they, they felt that this is something that we should really be paying attention to. And so um, working in the first, I was a career civil servant, but I worked in the first George, uh, well, in the George H.W. Bush administration. And then um, uh, I, after George Bush left office, I, I worked for the Clinton Gore folks for eight years. And then when they left office, um, we had George W. Bush come in. And when he left office at eight years later, I worked for the, uh, you know, the Obama um, folks. And so I kind of served throughout. And I felt it was always my job to serve the political masters of the day, whoever was um, you know, in charge. And that's, that's kind of how I viewed it. I will say though, it's, it was a roller coaster um, because the issue became uh, just so highly, highly visible, so much press, so much interest in it, so much concern about it worldwide that um, working in this little office at the State Department trying to, to do this was really very, very difficult. We were involved with two things. One was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which assesses the science, um, the adaptation uh, possibilities and mitigation, mitigation meaning how to reduce, avoid or sequester greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, and then the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I was the number two in the delegation, US delegation that negotiated that agreement um, in 1992 that President George H.W. Bush signed at Rio at the Earth Summit in, in June of that year. Um, and it was, it's rather interesting. I say it was a bipartisan issue then. Um, George H.W. Bush was, well, the United States was the fourth country overall and the first industrialized country to ratify that agreement, the Framework Convention on Climate Change um, in record time. It was unbelievable how quickly it went through the Senate and how quickly the president was able to ratify and proclaim it. Um, but then I, I continued because the, a number of people felt that the Framework Convention on Climate Change was rather toothless. It didn't, it didn't have any firm requirements for anybody to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is the concern that people have today. So um, we, we then embarked on it with a new administration, uh, Clinton Gore, um, negotiating a thing called the Kyoto Protocol, which uh, became very controversial after the fact because for, for really two reasons, I think that the criticisms, the two criticisms leveled at it were that it would, it contained no commitments, um, no serious commitments for developing countries where emissions are growing fastest in the world. Um, and it also, uh, people felt that it would har somehow harm the US economy. And those were the two criticisms that were directed at that agreement. Um, and as a result, the United States negotiated it. We took part in the negotiation. We did uh, some really amazing things, but we never, uh, Clinton never submitted it to the Senate for advice and consent, and the United States didn't ratify it. When, um, when George H. Or George W. Bush came in uh, after Clinton, he announced that we would not join that agreement. And that then triggered yet another effort, a uh, big negotiating effort toward um, in 2000, it was supposed to cul culminate in 2009 in the, in the uh, Copenhagen Accord which was supposed to be the successor to Kyoto. Uh, but Copenhagen was viewed as a huge failure um, of multilateral negotiations, multilateral diplomacy. So, um, but that, it's fascinating because Copenhagen contained within it all of the seeds that appeared, you know, six years later in the Paris Agreement of 2015. So, so, so I, let's, let's talk, thank you, that, that, that was fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about 2015 because um, I remember in the in May of 2015, um, I heard your voice on NPR and I yelled, hey, that's Dan. And you were talking about um, the negotiations that would eventually lead to the to the Paris Agreement. Um, it is said, I mean, I think it was the biggest multinational agreement probably in, in, in history. And some have called it the most complex negotiations that were ever undertaken. And you co-chaired the negotiations with a colleague of yours from Algeria. 
When I heard you that morning on NPR, I think you said it was like herding cats. So I'd love, we'd love to hear what your role was. A lot of your role was behind the scenes, but what was your role and what was it, what was it like sort of how did, how did this actually come about? I think there were 140 countries that signed on. So how did, how did that happen? So I think I missed a little bit of that, but it's, it's, it's okay. You were talking about the, the role as the chair. It's a very different thing to represent a country as a negotiator in a, in a multilateral setting from chairing a, a big effort like that, because the chair really can't represent, uh, can't advocate for his or her country. The chair so I'm gonna to interrupt you for a second. You, you mo- they moved you over to the, to the UN, right? So that you could do this. How, so, because- No, I continued, I continued to work for the State Department. Okay. But uh, I was able though to, to um, kind of not be there all the time. I felt it was important to have a slightly different um, role in that year when I was co-chairing. Uh, so I became a, a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia for the year just nominally so that I wasn't, you know, necessarily my, my boss at the state department, when I told her that uh, I had this opportunity to become the the chair of the negotiating co-chair of the negotiating process, she said, wonderful, but you're going to have to step aside for a year to do that because I need somebody to do the work around here. And I said, no, I understand. And she was very gracious and helped me. You know, we found someone to fill in behind me for the, the year. Um, but I was not, this was a process that began really um, after, after Copenhagen, uh, after this supposed debacle of a meeting that was held in, in 2009. Um, and it's, it was a very unusual kind of thing because they didn't have just two co-chairs. Well, first of all, most negotiations like this are, are chaired by a single person from the beginning to the end. This one didn't have a chair, it had co-chairs one from a developed country and one from a developing country. Now, why was that, do you suppose? Well, it's because nobody trusted anybody else. Developing countries didn't trust the chair from the north. Uh, Developed countries didn't trust the chair from the south. So we had to have co-chairs. The other thing is that they didn't have just two co-chairs for this period of time. They had six. They ended up with two co-chairs starting out in after 2009, one from Norway and one from India. Then about 18 months later, they switched and had an, one co-chair from the European Commission and another uh, co-chair from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And then for the final year, they had me and, and my friend Ahmed Jogla from Algeria. So um, they were rotating people from regions and rotating the, the, the co-chairs and it made it very, as somebody, somebody used this analogy a lot, but it's sort of like um, flying the plane, you know, building the plane while flying it. It was, uh, you know, just a kind of a crazy setup, but it had to do a lot with the lack of trust among all of the delegates. Um, Everybody was worried. Everybody was worried that it was going to come out against his or her interest. And that was the, that was the reason for mixing this up so much, but it also made it difficult because Ahmed and I had just one year to try to get it right. Um, we took over in, in really right after the Lima COP conference of the parties in um, 2014. Um, and then we ran it all the way to through to Paris in December of 2015. Now there's also a handoff between the co-chairs that run this process, this negotiating process through four or five different negotiating sessions of about two weeks each, a week to two weeks each. And then finally, the handoff to the presidency is called. Uh, and in this case, the presidency in 2015 um, was held by the French, uh, by a, a man named Laurent Fabius, who was the um, uh, foreign minister of France and a very clever, very clever, very capable guy. But his team took over in Paris for the final week. Paris ran for two weeks. Ahmed and I did it the first week, and then we handed off the, the issues to him in the second week. And that's what finally home. So that's a bit of the process. So I just assume that the way this works is that you basically, you and your coach are just sort of spent your life just going from meeting to meeting and negotiating yeah, and cajoling and promising and doing well, whatever needed to be done. And it's, it's very interesting because um, if a meeting is a week long, uh, Ahmed and I would get there a week before that. 
and and because there are countless groups with with whom you have to meet as a, a chair or co-chair. Um, for example, the the, Europe, the European Union uh, has a caucus, you know, so you've got to meet with the the EU. Um, Countries outside the European Union, another group called the Umbrella Group, to which the United States belongs, along with Russia, Ukraine, Iceland, Norway, all of the members of the OECD outside of the European Union belong to the Umbrella Group, except a, for a third group that consists of, um, they call it the Environmental Integrity Group that was, um, uh, it included uh, countries like Switzerland, Mexico, um, Liechtenstein, uh, a, a number of others, K Korea, South Korea. Um, why do countries in a big multilateral setting like this negotiate in groups? Well, it's because little countries will get flattened, they fear, by bigger countries in that setting. So they, they band together in different groups based on interests, based on regions, based on a number of different things. And so we would have to meet with these different groups to explain both what we were going to do in the coming week, get their concurrence, we hope, and then be able to start the process of negotiating. The reason this was so important is because everything comes apart if the process doesn't work, right? Um, and you have to get their buy-in to what you're gonna do. And you, you do that by coming up with a sensible plan, by sitting down and talking with them ad nauseum practically, and getting them to agree that, okay, we can, we can proceed in this way. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, yes, these are the issues we'll take up and this is the order in which we'll do them and so forth. Um, but it's very, it's very complex. It's very difficult because getting 197 countries to agree even on what time of day it is, is quite something, I will say. Okay, I said it was 140, it was 197, so thank you. <laughs> So I want to I want to switch now. So the deal got done, and I will tell the people that are tuning in that um, Dan, you may not remember this, but you did make like a headline in the final week or so. Is Dan Reschneider, co-chair, says, "quote We should be further along right now." At one point, there was a moment where where you thought maybe you're maybe maybe I thought maybe the process was breaking down. So we, we want to turn now to the to looking forward to where we are to where we are now. Um, I'm going to add that in 2014 you got your PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Um, the Paris work followed and then in 2017 you retired. Um, but you're still engaged in the work. You said to us ahead of time that people don't really retire now, they just do other things. Um, you give lectures and you teach classes on negotiating and climate change. And among other adventures, you're the adjunct, an adjunct professor at the University of Virginia. Uh, you sit on the, the board of the Woodwell Climate Research Center at Woods Hole. Um, and you're on an advisory board for the Congo Basin Institute. So you're still really connected to the people you knew and, and, and the work that's going on and, and, and this field generally, um, you're really tuned in. So here we sit, it's two days before Earth Day and you actually chose, you had a choice of dates and you chose this one because you knew it would be um, a big week. And in fact, yesterday, Vox ran the headline, Biden's climate leadership will be tested at the Earth Day summit. So the Biden administration has made climate change a central issue in its domestic and its foreign policy. And it wants to reclaim um, US leadership on this issue. So how tough do you think that will be? What, what are the major obstacles that you foresee? Well, um, the, the United States over the course of uh, the time I've been working on this has been what I would call an uncertain partner. Because uh, as I mentioned, we were negotiating the Kyoto Protocol, um, which was finally adopted in uh, 1997. And yet we never moved forward to uh, submit it to the Senate for advice and consent or to ratify it. So th the rest of the world did and the Kyoto Protocol entered into force and it is in force today. But um, the rest of the world looked at us and said, wait a minute, you said that we were, we should go forward with this agreement, let's negotiate it, let's um, you know, let's conclude it, which happened. And then the United States turned around and didn't, didn't join. Well, then we negotiated the Paris Agreement. Things changed and we negotiated the Paris Agreement. 
Um, and that was all, uh, that entered into force. The United States actually joined it. But then of course we changed administrations and the United States decided, no, we're not gonna join the Paris Agreement. We're gonna pull out of the Paris Agreement. Um, that was President Trump's uh, decision. Uh, and we actually withdrew from the Paris Agreement the day after the election. Uh, we then rejoined it again um, once President Biden came in. But the rest of the world has been looking at us as if to say, um, where are you coming from, United States? Um, first of all, they know that we are, uh, I hate to use the term indispensable party, but we really are an indispensable party for a number of reasons. Number one, because our emissions, they're not as large as China's. China's currently the largest um, current emitter of greenhouse gases, but we're the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And historically, I think we still are the largest emitter of greenhouse gases if you count back far enough. Um, but not, not just that. I mean, uh, we also have the technology, we have the resources, we have the people, um, we have endless um, capabilities that are really needed in the world to address this problem in a meaningful way. So the world really needs us. And frankly, we can't solve the problem alone. If we could, we would have left them all behind years ago. We need the rest of the world to solve this problem. But the world is looking at us now saying, wait a minute, you kind of led us to the altar two times and you, you, let, you abandoned us. And now, now you've, you're back, you know, President Biden, he's saying good things. John Kerry, his climate envoy is saying good things, but can we really count on the United States? So there's a question of, you know, how long can, first of all, are you going to do the right thing? And second of all, how long will it last? because we know you guys have elections and we know that there are differences in your country uh, and often that can lead to radically different policies. So it's gonna be a tough, it's a tough act. And not only that, but um, there was a great deal of hostility toward dealing with this issue at all under the previous administration. And for that reason, I think there's a lot of lost time to make up. So, um, President Biden is being looked at by people to say, okay, well, what are you going to do exactly? We, we understand you want to lead. Where do you want to take us? And what are you prepared to do to get there? What is the United States in particular going to do? And how will you guarantee that what you begin today will last into the future? That's the tough sell for them right now. So John Kerry, you told me before that um, one of the advantages of, I think, was he the Secretary of State during the time of the Paris Agreement? And one of the big advantages was he was really a true, a true believer. So um, he was really um, engaged in this. And he recently met with a representative from China. Um, and you were recently quoted in the Wire China saying, and I'm gonna quote you here, Dan, quote, if we can't work with China, I don't know what the future is going to be like for our children and our grandchildren, close quote. So how important is China to the whole issue of uh, global climate change? Well, I think I said, if we can't work with China on climate change. Yeah, okay. Because working with China is very complicated. Okay, I mean, sorry. I probably mistyped it. That's Go okay. Ahead. That's okay. But I mean, this is a, a, a very interesting aspect, I think, of the relationship with China. It's tough. The Chinese are tough. It's difficult working with them. But I will tell you during the Obama administration, one of the, despite all the problems that we had in, in terms of cybersecurity and internet, you know, um, uh, internet problems, and I mean, pick one, there were just countless problems with the Chinese, but the, a bright spot was always considered to be climate change. That's one area where the two countries' interests aligned and they could they could be seen to work together. And thank goodness, because they need to work together. The rest of the world is looking at the United States and China and saying, you guys are the big 200 pound, 800 pound gorillas, you know, whatever you do, we're just, we're just minnows, you know, you're the sharks in the water. I mean, we need to see where you're what you're going to do and where you're going to go. Uh, and that's going to set the pace and tone for everybody else. And that's why working with the Chinese on climate change is so critical. I think it's gonna to be tough working with the Chinese in other areas, uh, and it may still be tough working with them on climate change, but I think we know, and I think frankly, they know that we have to work together in this area. So do you have thoughts on um, Biden's team that he's brought, the people that he's brought on board to, to work on climate change? You shared a little of that with me before, but 
Um, what are your thoughts? Like, is it good that he brought John Kerry back? Um, like, do you think that do you think that the administration has the right people in place to do what they want to do? He he has an amazing team. Uh, he, he really has an incredible team because I, I've worked with many of these people over the years. Uh, Gina McCarthy is the domestic climate czar at the White House. She was formerly the head of EPA. I worked with, with her when uh, on, on issues involving the Montreal Protocol on depletion of the ozone layer, for example. And she's just, she's really fabulous. She's tough, but she's practical and she can talk you know, to people in a very practical kind of way. John Kerry you know, is, is extremely well known around the world. Everybody, he can walk into any capital, any foreign ministry. Everybody knows him and respects him. Uh, he has instant entree because he was formerly the Secretary of State. Um, you have other people like Janet Yellen, who's now um, at the, the Secretary of the Treasury. She's fantastic. I worked with her back during the, um, uh, during the Clinton uh, Gore administration and had enormous respect for her and was, was actually really pleased when she took over the Fed because I thought she's in, immensely capable and qualified. Um, just, and each one of them has a very deep bench of seasoned, um, well-respected, well-regarded people um, working for them. So it's, it's probably the best group of people we've ever had working on this issue across the board, across all the agencies of the government. So what I'm hearing from you, I think, is that this is not going to be easy, but you're feeling somewhat hopeful because they have at least a, a good team, a good team in place. Right. But the key is the key, once again, is is here at home. You know, it's what is the United States going to do? How seriously do we believe that in this problem? What are we prepared as a nation to do? Um, and, and that's really the important piece of it, because um, I say that you know, foreign countries routinely ignore what we say, but they almost never ignore what we do. Uh, and what we do is going to set the pace and the tone for the rest of the world. I'm convinced of it. And we may well be the place. I had a, a, an Indian colleague at one point say to me one night, he said, look, we all know that the solution to this problem is going to be invented by some guy in a garage in you know, Silicon Valley someplace. You know, I mean, this is, they're looking to the United States for the innovation, the creativity, the, the spark, and so forth for, uh, for much of this. But a lot of it has not so much to do with innovation, but with policy, with the will to approach this issue in a serious way and try to deal with our emissions of greenhouse gases. So how do you think... Um that will would best be shown to people that are looking for what we do rather than what we say. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, one of the things that's happening now is this infrastructure bill that's been proposed, for example. And there are many, many opportunities within that bill to, to do things uh, that will make a big difference when it comes to climate change. I mean, for example, a very specific one, uh, I have a, car, a friend who bought an electric car and he, he uh, uses it to drive out to a place that he has in West Virginia. And he picked me up one day here in, in the Shenandoah Valley and we drove down to Charlottesville. Well, we had, we had endless problems on the way down there trying to find a place where we could charge this car because there aren't that many charging stations around. And when you find them, they're little slow trickle charging stations where if we could sit there for 24 hours, we could charge the car up, but we couldn't, we needed a fast charge. Well, we found a couple fast charge places at a few dealers along the way. He had a Chevy Bolt, by the way. And um, he was able to go in and find a place where we could, you know, try to fast charge there, but um, they couldn't let him just walk in off the street and use their facility uh, for, for a long period of time. So um, finding charging stations, we got down to Charlottesville. There were lots of charging stations for Tesla's but Tesla makes a technology that doesn't work, at least at the time, it didn't with Chevy Bolt. So one of the things that the Biden folks have said we need to do is start producing hundreds of hun hundreds and hundreds of charging stations around the country um, in order to begin to electrify our vehicle fleet. That would be an enormous contribution, for example. Okay, so I think you've gotten to this some of this before, but one of the questions I had scripted here was, um, how much still needs to be done and will we be able to avert the worst impacts of climate change? Well, how much still, those are two questions really, because the first one is how much still needs to be done, an enormous amount still needs to be done. And fortunately, 
you know, it's been it's been very interesting to see the younger generation. I'm at a point. I still think I'm young, okay, but I know I'm not. And uh, well, I'm young. I don't know why you. I mean, you and I are the same age, and I'm really young, Dan. Exactly. I know, but there are younger people than us, Dan. <laughs> The point is they are very enthusiastic and very committed to trying to solve this problem. I, I've run into countless numbers of young people who view it as the existential problem of their generation and their lives. And they, they really want to work on this, which is incredible um, to me. I, I just started working on this issue in 1989 because I thought I could get promoted. That's all, what I had in mind. I, I wasn't going to save the planet you know, at the time. And um, so I, I'm very buoyed up by seeing the enthusiasm that young people have for it. And that's really where the change needs to occur. Um, will we be able to solve it in time? Uh, that, is, that question is still out there and it hasn't been answered yet because emissions are, uh, the world is, is emitting uh, far more uh, greenhouse gases than, than, we can, um, than we can really tolerate. And, we've got to get a handle on this if we're to avoid the most adverse impacts of, of, of climate change. Sure. Um, we do have some questions and I'm going to turn to them, but I, I have one last one that um, I think you've touched a little bit on, but go back to this concept of um, negotiating these complex agreements, because I know um, when you and I had dinner right after you came back from Paris, you talked about um, your passion for, you know, the art of negotiating these complex things, whatever the topic is, there's that you are, you are driven to, to, to come, have many parties come together for an agreement. And I, you said you have this, um, this motto that you are known for process is substance. So can you, and I think that's probably what you're referring to. Can you talk to us a bit about that your motto process is substance? Yeah, I, I, I have met a lot of young people coming into the State Department, for example, who, who will say to me, listen, I don't care you know, where an issue is decided as long as it's decided the right way. And I just look at them and I say, my friend, if you don't care where an issue is decided, you will never see the issue decided the right way. Um, the, the framework for going about this is critical and people often don't understand that. Um, I remember, I could just give you an example. One of the problems in a big multilateral negotiation is that if you're from a little tiny island country in the, in the Pacific Ocean, for example, and you maybe can send two people to this conference and it's a conference that involves, I mean, in Paris, I think there were you know, 50,000 people or 40,000 people, something on that order. You're, you're representing your little country. I mean, you're gonna get run over, but like, you know, squashed. And so how do you, you get very nervous, you get very upset, you can't follow all the issues. You don't know what's going on. What are they doing over here? What's happening over there? What am I having to trade off? And so one of the things that's critical is to, is to be able to take the time and explain to people simply what's happening. And I remember I, when I came in, um, I, because I, co I chaired the process for after, after Copenhagen the second year in, in the run up from, from Cancun to Durban, I chaired the process. And I remember saying to the secretariat, we're going to have a plenary. We're going to meet with all 197 countries every morning at 10 o'clock. And they thought I'd lost my mind. They thought this guy, what happened? It, it, it's insane. Every time you had a meeting of that many countries, it first of all, it could never last a half an hour, which is what I said it would last. It never begins on time, it never ends on time, and there's always an eruption of some kind. I said, nope, we're gonna have a, a meeting of a half an hour every morning because I'm gonna take that time and I'm gonna to explain to everybody what happened the day before. And I'm gonna have, it's not just gonna be me up there on the dais, it's gonna be all the chairs of all the different subgroups that we had reporting on what they did in their subgroup and what they see coming up for today. And all they're gonna do is provide information and respond to a few questions. And then we're gonna stop and then we'll go negotiate. But you know, things like that, providing the transparency, giving people the assurance that things aren't happening that they don't know about, so critical. And that's why I say process is substance. You have to, um, you have to get the process right if you, I, I've said to people that, you know, if you don't have, um, 
if you don't have, if you have a good process, you may not still get a good result, a good substantive outcome. But if you have a bad process, I guarantee you will never have a positive outcome. Yeah, I think that advice really uh, translates in a lot of places. I know I've run two search committees where I kept saying, if the process is good, you know, we'll get the best result and over communicate, over communicate, over communicate. So um, you said that very well. I think that's really good advice, whether you're dealing with international negotiations or maybe even talking at home with your kids, right? So um, either way, it's good. We do have some... The only people who don't listen to me are my children. That's the only, that's the only thing. well. That's that's part of being old, Dan. Oh wait, we're not old. We're young. Okay, so I'm going to open up. We've got some stuff in the chat, so I'm going to read some of these questions. Um, here's one that goes back to fisheries. Uh, many years ago, I met a woman who was an international inspector on commercial fishing boats. She said because of that, she could no longer eat fish because of the terrible condition she wit witnessed aboard the vessels. She said the workers never left the processing floor when they were hauling in fish, resulting in, well, unsan unsanitary conditions. What are your observations? Please, we like fish, so don't say anything that's too, diff you know, too difficult for us to take. What are your thoughts? No, I, I love fish, and I was, I was fortunate. I was a member of uh, three different um, so-called fishery management councils that were set up under the Magnuson Act. Um, after we extended our jurisdiction to 200 miles. And at one point I was able to go out on a Polish factory trawler about 30 miles off the coast of North Carolina. And it's unbelievable. You can't imagine seven tons of mackerel coming up and it's seven tons of fish. I mean, you're, it's up over your head and they're running it down into the factory and they're filleting it and they're putting it in boxes and they're freezing it and they're grinding up the offal for fish meal. Uh, it's an unbelievable you know, kind of process. But of course, some countries um, and some nations are better than others when it comes to the conditions that they, they maintain on their ships and, and the conditions of their workers. And I can well imagine uh, this, this lady, um, you know, encountering some pretty, pretty tough conditions aboard some of those fishing vessels. They, you know, we would put observers aboard the foreign vessels when they came into our zone. And I'm, I'm sure she's referring to an experience as an observer aboard one of those foreign fishing vessels. And it could be quite, you know, quite difficult. Well, I'm glad you didn't give up fish. Um, and I'm not giving up fish either. So um, have you read Stephen Kooning's new book, Unsettled? Are you familiar with that? Have you read it? There's an article that came out in the, in the, in the Wall Street Journal on the 16th of April. Um, that uh, you know, that talked about it, but no, I don't think it's out yet. At least not on the bookshelves. It's not coming out till May, as I understand it. Do you have any thought? I mean, do you do you know anything about it yet? I think did you tell me that you've heard some of your pals at Woods Hole are not enthused about it, or? Well, in in the run up to uh, to this session today, I actually got hold of the article. It was an article written by a, a guy named. Um, Holman Jenkins um, on the 16th of April in the Wall Street Journal. And the problem is I, I read it. It was all about Jenkins' take on what is in uh, Kunin's book. And I, I, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell whether the things that you know, uh, Jenkins was, was quoting and saying really are Kunin's views or whether they're his own views. I mean, I think that Jenkins has been a kind of a climate skeptic for a number of years. Um, he uh, advanced a number of points that were consistent with that. You know, everything is fine. Don't worry. You don't need to stimulate technology because the market will take care of everything. Um, you know, we can't solve this problem. And even if we could solve this problem, um, developing countries will never do anything. So why bother? I mean, it's all of the laissez-faire type of arguments for why nothing will work. And if it does work, others won't join us. And so just don't think you can solve any problem like this. I was, I was really disappointed by the article, and I can tell you all the people that I work with at Woods Hole Climate Research Center were just, you know, very upset because they feel a lot of these arguments that Jenkins was advancing are just the same old, you know, same old negative things that we've sure. seen over the many years. So, yeah. So here's one. Um, what do you think of the impact of the energy used in mining cryptocurrency? as the use of that currency is growing exponentially. Well, well I, think, I think cryptocurrency is a bigger threat to uh, the established world order than practically anything. I mean, um, 
you know, not to be able to track who's paying what for, for what and, and, and financial movements across borders. To me, uh, I think that the, the government of the United States and the governments of the world ought to be very concerned about that. Now, the question is about the energy used to create the cryptocurrency. Um, sure, that's an issue, but um, I would think that um, the, the bigger issue is really the cryptocurrency itself. Here's a question I love. Are there lessons that you learned in applying your negotiating skills that could bring together the polar or stop the polarization here in the United States? I think so. I think so, because key to everything is listening to people. I mean, you, you've gotten me talking today and all I've been doing on this in this session is talking. But um, one of the most important things is to really try to listen to what the other person is saying. And to try to, I, I would tell people in my classes, I teach, I teach a class in multilateral environmental negotiation. And when I first designed it, I was terribly afraid that it was so esoteric that I'd never have any students. Well, it was incredible. I had, had all kinds of interest in it. But one of the things I tell them is when you're in a negotiation and someone on the opposite side says no to a proposal that you're making, stop and start asking questions. You know, why do you feel that way? What's behind the no? What's going on? What's the fear? What's the anxiety? What's the issue that causes you to say no? Because nine times out of 10, I have found that the, what gives rise to the no is something that is easily solvable. It's something that is tangential to my central interest that I can easily fix and so understanding where the other person is coming from, understanding what's beneath that no and what gives rise to that no is a way of then finding a way to solve my problem and the other person's problem. And I think that's, that's really key. The other thing I would say is that you never wanna have a negotiation where you clean the other person's clock. What you need is a negotiation where each side is satisfied, maybe not ecstatic, but satisfied with the outcome because you need, a, you need an outcome that's going to endure. And things where people feel fleeced or feel taken won't endure. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us on this, in this um, session have probably seen that. I know when I was negotiating legal contracts, you know, we had to sit down over dinner after the closing dinner, we had to be able to get along. And then just for the audience, since I'm here and I'm always touting this, um, since somebody asked about polarization um, politically, is there's a fabulous book written. It's published by the Cato Institute. It's my favorite political book called The um, Three Languages of Politics. And it talks about how we come from questions from a different lens. And the gist of the book, which is a short book, is basically seek first to understand before being understood. So listen first, find out where the other person is coming from. That is the only way that you can build you know, a bridge. So. Um, I got my pitch for that book in there. Go ahead, Dan. I will just tell you, I, I worked a lot as a, as a cook and, and in kitchens before I ever, you know, I, in fact, I was amazed when I started working for the federal government that you could actually get paid money uh, for doing things like writing letters. You know, I, I had associated, I had associated money and income with sweat up to that point, you know, but I remember working in a kitchen and I learned an awful lot of things there. And one of the things that people would say to me, yep. The same people you step on on the way up are usually the ones you're going to meet on the way back down. So, you know, watch out. That's right. And Never burn a bridge, right? There are, there are all kinds of little aphorisms like that that I learned in the, in, the, uh, in the kitchens that, you know, have stood me very well in life. Sure, sure. So someone asked, like, what, what do you think the most reasonable expectation for what can be accomplished in the next two to four years? Okay, one of the problems I've always had with politicians being a career civil servant is that um, politicians want to see spontaneous combustion. <laughs> they have an idea and they want it to go from, from embryo to, to you know, vast you know, application throughout the economy overnight. And you know, I, I have to say to them every time they come up with a brilliant idea and some of the ideas truly are brilliant. But I have to, I start saying you have to begin and build. And let me tell you something, there is nothing that a politician hates more than hearing somebody like me say you have to begin and build. Because for most politicians, the world begins when they arrive and it ends when they depart. 
and they have no concept of what happened before or what's coming in the future because that's beyond their time in office. And I, I can just tell you, it, it makes it really tough because politicians have very short time frames by and large. Sure, that sounds a little like Jim Collins' book, Built to Last, where he's talking about building the machine and, and it takes time. So um, so here's one that you may not, because I know you're traveling, you were on the road this morning. Apparently John Kerry got criticized in today's Wall Street Journal opinion page for giving too much to China. And then the question is, who's right? My guess is you haven't read the article because you've been traveling, but do you have thoughts on, on what uh, Kerry, and I, you told me who he was, who he met with over the weekend. I don't, I'm not in tune to this, but did, is, is it possible that John Kerry gave too much to China in his meeting? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, the, the person he likely met with is a guy named Shea Genoa. Um, um, and he has been the head of the Chinese delegation for many years. He was formerly the um, China's uh, Minister of the Environment, a very knowledgeable, very skilled um, guy who actually retired after the Paris Agreement uh, and probably was having a fine old time. But the Chinese government, when, when, when uh, Biden was elected, they brought him back, which is quite unusual. They don't usually in China's system bring people back out of retirement. It's nowhere near, it doesn't happen anywhere near as often as it does in our system, for example. Um, but I took that as a very positive sign because Xi Jinping knows John Kerry. John Kerry knows Xi Jinping. Um, there's been a lot of distrust and a lot of um, animosity between the Chinese and us in the past four years for a whole host of reasons. Um, and it's gonna be very difficult to begin to figure out how to how to find your way forward in an area like climate change where we really do have uh, aligned interests in cooperating um, or at least coordinating our actions. Um, and I think that it's a very positive thing that they brought Xi Jinping back. Now, it doesn't surprise me for one minute that in the first meeting John Kerry has with him, some journalist someplace is gonna say, well, you gave away too much. You know, I don't know what he had to give away, but whatever it was, he probably, it was probably too much. I mean, that, you know, that's kind of standard fare. And it's tough being in John Kerry's position um, because you're gonna be criticized. You know, you're gonna be criticized. Not everybody's gonna like what you do or what you say. But the point is you gotta, you gotta get out there in the arena and swing the bat, you know? That's what it's all about. Sure. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna end with this question. We've lost you. We have the beautiful field, Dale, uh, Dan, but we don't see you on your show. There you go. You're back. Came back okay. into you, yeah. So we're gonna end with this, um, this last one that um, actually um, Darren um, has put in the first test of the rotary states is it the truth with all the skepticism around climate science? It seems like solving the, politi the politicization of science and data could be the most um, existential hurdle. And I, I'm gonna tie that back to something that you, you said to me um, some time ago when you said that you have always spoken truth to power. So um, what, what are your thoughts on, on this question that, um, is the skepticism around client science, is that maybe one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with? Yeah, it is, but I, I mean, it is, it has been traditionally. I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking now and what I've been doing since I retired, um, for example, we, we were able to buy this, this wonderful log home in the Shenandoah Valley. And what did I do last October? I put in a geothermal uh, heating and cooling system where you drill wells into the ground and you're using the difference between the temperature above the ground and the temperature below the ground, both in the summer and the winter to heat and cool your home. So we got off of propane. We don't use propane for heating anymore out here. Now, when I did that, my electric bill jumped up and I thought, hmm, this is not so good. So just recently we were able to put in a solar array. I said, I just turned it on today for the very first time. Um, just before we began talking. And uh, so we're producing our own electricity now, um, hopefully either offsetting partially or offsetting completely the amount of electricity we use ourselves here, which is you know, our way of trying to say, you know, we have the ability to do these things. Uh, they make sense for all kinds of reasons 
cutting down on your electric bill and, and cutting down on your usage, um, you know, why not do them? I mean, just, and I, I think that by example, I think when my neighbors see what we've done, when they realize that they can save a lot of money with solar panels on their roofs, uh, and that there's a way to install this, I think eventually we're going to see solar panels on every roof you can you can find. So a lot of it's going to be just quietly doing the things that are going to make a big difference. Um, and you know, and I know you also said to me one time that one of the things that's great about America is our spirit and our go get itness and and the fact that we have this sense of independence and that we're responsible. I don't remember exactly how you said it, but we do we do as individuals take action on a lot of things. So. The fact that I'm talking to, you know, the Rotary Club and the Women's Club in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, incredible. That, those are two points of light, okay, in our society. There are a thousand points of light like this across this country. That is the strength of the country. Oh, sorry, I get worked up about this, but I'm, I'm just so proud of what we do and, and how we can do it, you know? All um, right. And that's been something that I've, I've been proud of and proud to represent in my career um, for the past 40 years. Well, I'm glad that we got you a little choked up there at the end. So our pro, I think we've answered all the questions and our program has come to an end and I'm actually over time. So I'm turning it back to Darren to close. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, Dan, for that uh, robust discussion. Um, in honor of leaders like yourselves uh, who speak to our club members, we will be making a donation to the YWCA Southeast Wisconsin, whose mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. A few quick announcements. Uh, looking ahead to next week, please join us for a provocative conversation led by Dr. Joan Prince, retired Vice Chancellor of Global Inclusion and Engagement at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, with the heads of two of Milwaukee's leading philanthropic organizations. Ellen Gilligan, President and CEO of the Greater Milwaukee Foundation and our very own Rotarian Joanne Anton, President of Herb Cole Philanthropies. Another quick note that uh, the link to RSVP for our in-person Tuesday meeting, May 4th is uh, live. Due to the quick uh, work of the folks in our Rotary office who fixed that link over the duration of the program. So thank you to them. So again, check out that link to register. Uh, hope to see you all this Thursday uh, for our snack program or back here next Tuesday. And for those who have a few more minutes and a few more questions, uh, we will be keeping the Zoom room open for another 15 minutes or so so you can continue the conversation. Again, thank you to all of you for being here today, including our friends at the Women's Club of Wisconsin. Our meeting is adjourned. Thanks, Taryn. So Dan, if you wanna stay on, I don't know if we have more